again. Good morning. Welcome to uh, Hope Church. Glad that y'all are here, whether you are in the room masked with us or you're watching online. Thank you so much for just being here. And I want to say a special thank you to Mark Franklin last week who uh, preached uh, on identity or preached on actually um, what it means to be a godly individual and what does it look like to live a godly life. If you didn't get a chance to check that out, go back and listen to it. Um, it, was, it was really just impactful. So thanks, man, for, for, for preaching there. Um, we, this week, are picking back up in Matthew. Those of you who um, are kind of maybe newer to Hope Church or have been watching online and now you're kind of in person with us, um, we just finished our winter spiritual practice of scripture reading. And today we're going to be back in Matthew chapter 4. We are going through the Gospel of Matthew, which is Matthew's biography of Jesus, uh, and it's going to take us about 14 years to get through it, okay? I'm just kidding. Like, some of you guys are like, oh, I'm in. 14 years, I'm in. Awesome, awesome. We'll, we'll still be here. Uh, it'll probably take us about three years to get through, but um, it, it, we're kind of walking through because what we want to do and understand is what does it look like for us to be apprentices of Jesus, at Hope Church, our vision statement is this, okay? We exist, we here in this room, we exist to bring hope to our community by practicing the way of Jesus until it is in Nashville as it is in heaven. There's a lot that goes into that. We actually preached on that. We did a vision series back in the fall. We're going to do it again this coming fall. But basically the word that I want you to focus on there is that word that's in bold, which let's say it together, is the word what? Practicing. Right? It's practicing. Right? This is not just a good idea. Right? Jesus isn't just a guy who had a lot of cool things to say or did some really cool things. We believe that Jesus is our teacher, our rabbi, and we are his apprentices. Some of us grew up in a tradition where it's like, hey, I go to church on Sunday, I check it off the list, I read my Bible, like I'm good. But we never really saw anything happen in our lives. We never really saw a transformation happen. And some of us, quite frankly, myself included, have been kind of disappointed by this disconnect that we see between what the Bible says people of the faith should do and what reality is actually happening. And so here at Hope Church, we believe that the only way we will see ourselves transformed, then our marriages, then our relationships, our community, our nation, dot, dot, dot. The only way we see that happen is by personally practicing the way of Jesus. So we're picking up on that this morning, and we're going to dive into Matthew chapter 4, looking at a very familiar passage, but something I think God wants to show us specifically to each and every single individual here in this room and online. So if you would just do this with me, we're going to stand and we're going to actually read this together, okay? I'll read it, um, but let's just stand together out of honor for the word of God. Matthew chapter 4, starting in verse 1, it says this. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. He fasted 40 days and 40 nights, and afterwards he was famished. The tempter came and said to him, if you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But Jesus answered, it is written, one does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, if you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, Again, it is written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. And he said to him, all these I will give to you if you will fall down and worship me. And Jesus said to him, away with you, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil left him and suddenly angels came and waited on him. This is the word of the Lord. You may have a seat. Now, right before Matthew chapter 4, here's a trivia question. It comes what? Matthew chapter 3. Okay? Trick question there. And at the end of Matthew chapter 3, if you remember what's happening, Jesus is getting baptized by a guy named John 
the baptizer. And look at the way chapter 3 ends. These are the last two verses of Matthew chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. It says this. And when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, this is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. Now, I'm not sure how your morning started. <laughs> Mine started with a pretty bad cup of coffee and my son playing dino trucks on the floor, okay? Like, this did not happen to me in my morning prayer time. But this was an epic moment in Jesus' life. I mean, here we would call this like a mountaintop experience, right? But look at what happens in the very next verse. Matthew 4, 1. Then Jesus was led up by who? The Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. The same Spirit in Matthew 3 that comes and rests on his shoulder immediately in chapter 4 takes him into the wilderness. Or another way of translating that is the deserted place in order to be tempted by the devil. Has that ever happened to you? Like, have you ever had, like, this amazing worship experience? You're on top of the world, man. You're feeling good. Life is going well. And then almost from out of nowhere, you, feel, you find yourself in, like, a, a deserted place. Mentally, emotionally, or maybe even spiritually. And you're like, what happened? I mean, yesterday was so good. And then, like, I woke up and it was Monday. Like, I don't really know what happened. Maybe for you it wasn't a spiritual crisis. Maybe for you it was something at work. Things are going well and all of a sudden you get that email from your boss and the subject line is, we need to talk. That never goes well, by the way, right? Or maybe relationships, you, you and your spouse or your kids or some other family member, things are going really well. And then all of a sudden you're like, things aren't going well. They're falling apart and you're not really sure what's going on. Or maybe just even physically, like you're on top of the world and then all of a sudden like, you decide to go running for a mile and you realize I ain't as young as I once was, right? Regardless of what your circumstances have been, all of us have been in that situation at some point in time. We're on a mountaintop one moment and the next moment, almost out of nowhere, we feel like we're staring face to face with the devil. But look at what happens next, verse 2. It says, and so in the midst of this, Jesus fasts 40 days and 40 nights and afterwards he was famished. Or as they say here in the South, he was hungry. I love this. Here's what I love about this, okay? I love this because this is a big deal. The fact that Jesus was hungry is a big deal. I think sometimes we get into church and we think about the divinity of Christ as we should. I mean, he did amazing things. He was 100% God, but he was also 100% man. We miss this fact that Jesus gets hungry. I mean, here's the question. When Jesus was doing all the miracles in the New Testament, right, when he's casting out demons, when he's feeding thousands of people, when he's seeing people healed and taking up their beds and walking, is he doing that as God or is he doing that as a person? Philippians 2 tells us, that when Jesus came to the earth, he voluntarily set aside his God card and became a human being. Which means this. He models for us what it means to be human, filled with the Holy Spirit, and everything that is possible because of that. What that means is that everything Jesus did during his time on earth, are things that you and I, as his apprentices, filled with the Holy Spirit, have the capability of doing as well. And y'all, think about that for a second. When we are filled with the same Spirit that Jesus is filled with, and we go through and we read all that Jesus said, all that he did, that should absolutely revolutionize the way we live our lives. We say it this way, as an apprentice of Jesus, we are to be with him, Become like him and do what he did. So was Jesus hungry? Oh, yeah, he was hungry. Why? Because he was human. Now, 
before we get into the rest of the passage, we have to remember that when we approach the Bible, when we read Scripture, we're doing so as people who have a certain worldview and a certain cultural context that's nothing like the worldview or the context of the writers of the Bible. I mean, how many of you, have you guys ever been in a situation where you recognize that the people around you did not share your cultural traditions or your cultural norms? My wife and I, my family and I, we actually, we lived overseas for a few years in Central Asia. And while we were there, um, it, it's a very strong, like, tea culture. Tea is a very, very big deal for them. And they would actually judge how good of a host you were based upon how well you made the tea. If you made your tea poorly, they were like, we're not going to Rumbo's house because his tea's pretty bad. But if you made your tea good, not only were you considered a good host, they actually had a word to describe the type of tea that you drank, and it was the phrase, Tav Shang Kona. Like, doesn't that just sound like epic? It's pretty, actually pretty awesome until you realize that Tav Shang Kona means, in the local language, rabbit's blood. Like, I'm a good old southern boy. I like my tea sweet, not bloody. Right? It's just kind of gross, right? But, like, you're in this moment, you're like, rabbit's blood. You totally ruined this awesome moment we were having together. But as we read Scripture, you and I are kind of in the middle of this moment as well. When we come across these cultural things that are very deeply rooted in first century Jewish culture, things that for us are maybe a little odd or maybe a little out of the box. And we have to, for a minute, kind of suspend our 21st century postmodern Western filter, put it on the side, and kind of come back and go, okay, if I was a first century Jew, what would be happening here? And if we're going to be honest, when we read this passage, what we see is that there's three layers of what's happening in this text. So what I want to do briefly is I want to unpack each of these three layers for you. And then I'm going to show you at the end kind of what this means for us and how we practice it. Okay? You guys still with me? Fantastic. All right. Layer one we see is resisting temptation. I think right out of the gate, a lot of us struggle with a very good but I think tough question. It's this. What is God's role when it comes to temptation? Like when we face temptation in our life, where, where is God in all of that? It's almost like sometimes we have this idea of God like kind of dangling some forbidden chocolate in front of us. He's like, come on, take it, take it, right? Or, or he's kind of like that cop that's waiting to catch you in the speed trap, right? So if you go 46 miles instead of 45 miles an hour, like he's got you, right? Like that's just kind of this idea that we have of God. But that's actually not at all the picture the Bible paints of who God is and what he does in regards to temptation. Look with me at James chapter 1. It says this in verse 13. It says, let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desires. Then desire, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it's fully grown, brings forth death. The word that's used in Matthew chapter 4, and also the word that's used here in James 1, for the word tempted, actually is less like an undercover cop who, you know, specialized on a scene of law and order, and more of like something else that's happening, and it's closer to our word tested. If you go a few streets down, and you make a right on Cahal Avenue, it's kind of heading back toward my house, there's this bridge you got to go under, and it's got a train trellis that goes above it. And over the past couple of weeks, I don't know, just because of the snow or the weather or whatever the case may be, they've actually in the mornings shut off that part of the road. And they've got all this equipment out there kind of inspecting the bridge and checking out the ground around it and the actual railway above it. Why? Because if the ground gives way, if that bridge somehow cracks and falls and a train is going across it, those cars are in danger of not only toppling over, but crushing the houses beneath it. And you're looking at potentially not just loss of, of property, but loss of life. See, it's important to understand the structural integrity of a railway bridge. Otherwise, you're going to be dealing with a much bigger, much more deadly issue. That is exactly the same word that's used in this passage. 
Being tested is, is less about God trying to catch you up at some little thing that you're doing and more about te- testing the structural integrity of the foundation of your life. Without going through various tests, if you will, the structural integrity of our relationships with God and with others would never be able to withstand the pressure of the world. That is what Jesus is showing us in this moment. He's showing us what it's like to have the structural integrity of his life tested and then to resist the temptation to allow the cracks in the foundation to form by believing the lies that he's told. That's layer one. Layer two. We see that what Jesus is going through in Matthew 4 actually occurs much earlier in the Bible, in the book of Deuteronomy. In Deuteronomy 6 through 8, there's a story of Israel walking through the wilderness, being tested by God. And what's interesting is when Jesus is having this conversation with the enemy, he's actually referencing three different passages in those three chapters. In other words, what he's doing is this. He's saying there's something very specific happening here that parallels to what's happening back over here. The book of Deuteronomy, if you've not read it, it's kind of like Moses' game day locker room speech. Right, you guys ever watch those movies, you know, like Remember the Titans or something like that, and the coach always gets in there, you know, and they get in the huddle, and there's kind of like that chanting, and they're all dancing and doing all that kind of stuff. And they're getting psyched up, and they're going to go out, and they're going to win the game. That's the book of Deuteronomy. Moses is getting God's people psyched up to go out and take the promised land, and he's remembering them of all of the promises that God has given to them, all the things that he has done. And in the midst of that, God tells them very some very specific things that we actually see show up here in Matthew chapter 4. There's some interesting parallels. First, we see the setting. Right? Both Israel in Deuteronomy 6 through 8 and Jesus in Matthew 4 are in the wilderness. The second, we see the number 40. Israel is in, in the wilderness for 40 years. Jesus is in the desert for 40 days. We see both are tested. We see that both are hungry, and both are fed by God. Israel is fed by manna, and Jesus is fed at the end of this this story by angels who come and attend to him. And last, and this is what I think is the most crucial, both are called God's son. Israel is called God's son, and Jesus, remember in Matthew 3, is also called God's son. There's a lot more layers to this particular part of the story. There's a lot of symbolism that's happening in the parallels between Jesus and between Israel in the Old Testament. And um, we could really go down a very deep rabbit hole. Um, But what I want to do instead is I want to point you to a resource, somebody that I've referenced before, a guy named Michael Heiser. He wrote a book called Reversing Herman. If you're like me and you like to geek out on this stuff, just let me encourage you. Pick it up, read it, you're going to love it, okay? But for the sake of our time this morning, I want to kind of look more big picture. Israel goes into the wilderness for testing, and what happened? They failed. But they didn't just like bomb out. They failed so badly that God was like, okay, this whole generation is not going inside. Parents, you ever been like that? You're like, look, if you say, can I one more time? It's over, right? That's kind of what's happening here. They had to wait for an entire generation to die out just so they could go into the promised land. But where Israel failed, Jesus actually succeeds. Where the first son, Israel, couldn't pass the test, we see that the second son, Jesus, did. And here's the connection. You ready? God's plan of salvation was supposed to come through Israel. God had told a guy named Abraham way back, hey, you are going to be the father of nations, and one of those nations is going to be my representative of mercy and grace and love and salvation to the world. But how did Israel do? Not so great, right? I mean, they, they bombed. Instead of going and bringing salvation to the world, they failed so badly that God had to actually save them first so that they could then be a representative of God to the world. It's kind of like if you were um, going down the street and you were to come across a car crash here on Gallatin. 
And so you pick up the phone, you're like, hey, um, 911, we need an ambulance to come because there's this mass chaos. And they're like, sure. And so they dispatch an ambulance, and on the way, the ambulance gets into a car accident. That's what's happening here. The rescue plan needed rescuing. But what Jesus did was he came to show that where Israel failed, he was going to succeed. And not only is he going to succeed during this Matthew 4 chapter of testing in the wilderness, he's going to succeed all the way to the cross and save not just Israel, but every single aspect of humanity. Now, if you and I are honest, when it comes to thinking about Israel and Jesus, we probably relate more to Israel in this story than Jesus, right? I mean, all the areas that we've blown it and where we wanted to be the best husband, the best wife, the best co-worker, the best whatever, all of those areas, and we've just failed. And all the failures, they just kind of weigh on us. If you think about like wearing it like a backpack, each failure is a brick, and brick after brick goes in that backpack, and you're just carrying it around, and you roll out of bed in the morning, and you put that backpack back on, and you go, and you meet with your family, you go into your workspace, you go into your neighborhood, and you still got that backpack on, and it is getting heavy. And what the beauty of what Jesus did was he said, hey, give that to me. We take that backpack off, and he takes it on himself. That's the beauty of what's happening in this story and all throughout the life of Jesus. Romans 8, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For those who are an apprentice of Jesus, that backpack can come off. But, and this is the third layer, Jesus' vocation as Savior is directly tied to his identity. And this is where I want to spend the rest of our time. See, before Jesus goes into the wilderness, the heavens open up, the Spirit comes down, and a voice proclaims over him, this is my Son in whom I am well pleased. This is the most crucial and powerful statement that any human being could ever hear. God the Father, that he would say over you, as he does Jesus, that you are his daughter. That you are his son. And that he is extremely proud of you. But notice, Jesus' identity didn't come from his parents. You guys remember the story, right? Jesus' mom and dad, Mary and Joseph, an angel comes to them and says, hey, you're going to have a son and he is going to be the savior of the world. Talk about pressure, Right? I mean, as a parent, I'd be like, okay, Jesus, you can't hang out with those people, right? Save your, you know, like, you know, we're not going to play soccer. We're going to play baseball because, you know, like, like, you know, like, just think about the pressure that that puts on you. But Jesus' identity didn't come from his parents. It didn't come from his friends or his career choice. His identity came from his heavenly father. And he needed to hear that from the father himself. Remember, Jesus is a man. When he put that God card aside, he doesn't know everything. That's why you see him over and over again asking questions. He's asking questions in prayer. He's asking questions of other people. And the reason why he's asking is because he, he doesn't know. I mean, Luke says that he grew in wisdom and in understanding. And so just like us, as we're growing in understanding, so did Jesus as a man. And he needs to hear from God, you are my son, and I am pleased by you. And y'all, if Jesus needed to hear that, how much more do you and I need to hear that? Jesus actually needed to hear what God said in order to have the resolve to do what he was going to have to do. For the kingdom of God to actually come to earth and be on display, Jesus needed to hear and then be tested in his identity. And if he did, boy, you and I both do too. But think about this. If you know who your heavenly father is, then you're going to know who you are as well. I mean, if you know that your father is the king of kings, then that means you are royalty. You're not a peasant. You don't have to have this victim or poverty mentality. I don't know if God has enough to take care of me. 
I don't know if God sees me. I don't know if God can really fix my situation. I don't know if he really can heal me. Look, if your father is the king of kings, that means you are not an orphan. You are a beloved son or daughter of the most high God. So what Jesus does, he leans into this. He leans into what God the Father has declared about him. And he goes into the wilderness with this frame of mind. And what does the enemy go after? His identity. You see that? If you are the son of God, he says it twice. And at this moment, Satan honestly has no idea how Jesus' life is going to end. But he does know that regardless of what Jesus' life holds, if he can distract him from what God has declared about him, then Jesus would no longer be a threat. That's the enemy's strategy for Jesus, and it's the same strategy he uses for you. But in his attempt to distract Jesus from what God had declared about him, he decides to use three different tactics, three different temptations, if you will. Let's look back at what they are. Temptation number one in verse in chapter 4, verse 3, it says that the, the tempter came to him and said, hey, if you're the son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But Jesus answered, it's written, one does not live on bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Here's, here's the heart behind that statement that, that the enemy makes. It's the question, should the son of God use his power and authority by the spirit to make himself bread to provide for himself when he's hungry, or should he wait on the Father? What Jesus said was that he was going to trust the Father to provide, even when it took a while. Even when Jesus has his own ability. Th think about this. It's not that turning a rock into bread is a bad thing, right? I mean, it's not really a bad thing. That in itself is wrong, but what's wrong is this. It's the heart of the temptation. Who do you trust. If you think about it a few weeks ago when we talked about the Garden of Eden, that's the same question the snake, the serpent, asked Eve. That's kind of what he was getting at. Do you really trust God? Can you really trust God? Is it right for me to listen to God or should I just take care of myself? In this moment, Jesus is tempted to take care of his own needs, take matters in his own hands. This is a theme throughout Scripture and throughout all of our lives. I mean, there are things that we want, and God has not given them to us yet. And we are very tempted, and a lot of times we just kind of give in to this, you know what, I'll just do it myself. This is something that God has really been working on me. See, inside of me, in my head, there's this little narrative that says this. You need to be successful. Now, there's nothing wrong with being successful. I'm not, I'm not dogging that. But the question for me is how, or why, rather, and at what cost? You see, for me, there's a voice inside that says, look, if you're going to be successful, then what you need to do is uh, you need to get people to like you. And if people don't like you, well, then you're not really worth much. So you need to be funnier, smarter, more spiritual, and more business savvy than the people around you. Because then people will think you're important and they'll think you're successful. But the problem with that, other than the fact that it's really incredibly narcissistic, is that where do you draw the line? I mean, how successful is successful enough? Is it when we have 500 people here on a Sunday morning? 1,000? Is it when we have a, a member of Hope Church in every school in Davidson County? Is it when we've got, you know, the Hope Church brand? Like, like, like what does that even mean? How successful is successful enough? Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't set goals. Like, goals are important. But if your goal, if my goal is to become the best, in order to increase my value, I will always walk away disappointed. For me, what this temptation does is it drives me to work more, to read more, to listen to more podcasts, to do more and more and more, which creates me, which creates in me this, this incredibly busy life. I give up time with family. 
give up time doing spiritual practice. I give up time doing things that I know will actually be life-giving to me. Why? At the sake of listening to a narrative of a lie that's constantly going in my head. And in the midst of this, you know what God's saying? Slow down. Slow down. Your value doesn't come from that. Your value comes from what I've declared about you, which is you are my son. And I am proud of you. Here's the catch. When we try to take things into our own hands, we begin to get off track. And ultimately, that short circuits the possibility of God coming through in your life. Some of us this morning are in a place that the wise Dr. Seuss calls the waiting place. Right? You're waiting. You've prayed for healing in a relationship or in a physical ailment, and you're waiting for God to come through. Some of you who are single this morning, you're, you've been praying for a spouse, and you're waiting for God to bring that person. Some of you, you've applied for a job, or you're waiting to hear about another job possibility, and you're, just, you're in that waiting process. And if this is you, let me just encourage you, look at the life of Jesus, who was willing to wait, even though he could take things into his own hands. He was willing to patiently wait for the Father, trusting that he would provide. Temptation 2, verses 5 through 7, says that the devil took him to the holy city. Basically, he put him on the top and he said, hey, if you're the son of God, throw yourself down. For it's written, he will command angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, it's written, don't put the Lord your God to the test. Here's... Here's the question behind that particular temptation. Should the Son of God trust the Father's love and protection and jump off the side of the temple to see if God would save him? Again, Satan's going after his identity, y'all. Hey, you, you know, are you sure the Father loves you? You should just, just make sure. Just jump. I mean, you're, you'll be, if he really loves you, you'll be fine. Like, just, just test it out. Right? And Jesus is like, no, 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 no. As the Son of God, I'm going to walk faithfully in what God has said. And I'm going to trust that if my foot does slip while I'm being obedient, God's got me. See, Jesus doesn't need to test God. He knows that God is good and he's going to take care of his son. Which leads to the third temptation. Verses 8 through 10. It says, again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, I will give you these if you'll bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, hey, get out of here. For it's written, worship the Lord your God and serve only him. And here's the question behind it. Should the Son of God take a shortcut to his inheritance of the kingdoms of the world? Remember, Jesus knew the scripture. He knew that in Daniel chapter 3, that one day the Son of Man, which was him, would be sitting beside the king of kings, and all the kingdoms of the world would be underneath his feet. He knew that. The question was, was he going to take a shortcut to get there? Notice in this moment, Jesus is solidifying his resolve to be patient, to trust the Father's path on that journey, and to wait for the kingdom to come. That's really at the root of all of us. Do, are we willing to trust God on the path that he set before us? This phrase that God's kind of been bringing to my, my mind a lot lately is this. The life of an apprentice of Jesus is simple. It's not easy, but it is simple. And what's interesting in all of this is that the enemy's not trying to get Jesus to commit this particular sin or that one. Right? He's not trying to, hey, turn stones into bread. and all that. Like, it, It's not necessarily about the specific temptations as much as it is about trying to undermine the trust between the Son and the Father. And to distract Jesus from living out his identity and his role as Savior of the world. It's not about breads and rocks. It's about hijacking the entire kingdom project. Some of us in the process of this... God has said something very specific to you. You know God has told you, you need to do something. And you've become distracted. You've allowed a relationship, career goals, something else to get in the way and completely 
derail and distract you from what God has called you to do. And today, this is your call back to that identity. Clarify who God says you are and resolve in your heart to walk in that past. And here's why. Here's why. Because behavior always follows identity. Behavior always follows identity. Who you believe you are will determine how you act. Jesus resolves with the Father. I'm your son and you're pleased with me. I'm the Messiah. And then out of that, he goes into the wilderness and he acts like it. And Satan's like, look, if you're the son, then you should do these things. Which implies the opposite. If you don't do them, then you're really not the son of God. And Jesus is like, I'm not playing that game. You clearly don't understand what's happening here. In my research this week, I came across this article. It was an NPR article about a guy named Robert Rosenthal. He was a Harvard professor. And he did this really interesting test. He, um, he took this normal IQ test, and he renamed it. He called it the, quote, Harvard Test of Inflected Acquisition. Because apparently, if you put the word Harvard on it, it makes it special, okay? But it was just a normal IQ test. And here's what he did. He took that IQ test to a bunch of third grade teachers, and he said, hey, if you get your kids to take this test, I can tell you which one of your kids is going to be a genius. Well, what third grade teacher doesn't want to know which kids are the smart ones and the dumb ones, right? So they're like, okay. So that's what they did. They applied this test. And Rosenthal got all the results. You know what he did? He threw out the test results, and he picked random kids. But then he put these kids in groups, and he went back to these third grade teachers, and he said, okay, I found them. These groups of children that I'm telling you, they are on the, quote, verge of an intense intellectual bloom. And so the teachers were like, okay. So you know what the teachers did? They took these kids, and they started giving them extra time for assignments. They started spending one-on-one -on -one time with them. They um, gave them a little bit more, like, extra special attention. They gave them extra credit, like, all these kind of things. They treated them special. And you know what happened with the kids? They started believing this about themselves. Look, I'm on the verge of an intense intellectual bloom, right? Like, I'm ready to go. Like, let's do this. And their IQ scores went through the roof. Why? It wasn't because they had some kind of special set of skills. It wasn't because they were super mature. It was because who they thought they were determined how they acted. Sociologists call this labeling theory. And that same principle is true for every single person in this room. Like some of us have an incredibly negative view of ourselves, either because of an absent parent or through just bad theology, a difficult childhood, middle school, right? And it's no wonder that we struggle with the things we struggle with. But what if I told you that you this morning were on the verge of an intense spiritual bloom and that how you see yourself will determine what you will become? The question this morning then is this. Who do you see yourself to be? Who do you see yourself to be? In Matthew 3, the father says he's pleased with Jesus and he is his son. Jesus believes this and acts accordingly. The father has said this morning, you are his son. You are his daughter. And you have a specific identity and a role that fits into the kingdom of God and it is unique to you. And it's not so you can go and do whatever you want so that you can fulfill your role in the kingdom, in Nashville, in your marriage, in your community, and around the world. And today is an invitation into that. But will you step into that entity? Will you step into that? Here's how you do it. Three things. First, read the scripture. Just read the scripture. Read what God has actually said about you. I would suggest starting with the book of Ephesians. It's a great way to get started on what God said about you. Second, pray. Practice what's called listening prayer, which is basically a conversation with God. Not just a list of demands, not just a list of prayer requests, but just like, hey God, here I am, here you are, let's talk. And the third, when you're praying, ask this question, who do you say that I am? God, who do you say that I am? 
And as you go through this process, what you're going to discover is that the answer is pretty simple. Not easy. Spiritual formation is very rarely easy. But it is simple. So let me just ask you this. Let me go ahead and get the band to come up. Let me just ask you this. Where does this land for you today? Where does this land for you today? Who does the Spirit say you are? Is there an area, maybe this morning, where you need to be like Jesus and resist a specific temptation? Is there an area where maybe you're struggling to trust God? You just need to take that thing out of your hands and say, you know what, God? Like, I'm, this is yours. I'm done. This is yours. Or maybe this morning, you just need to simply say, God, who do you say I am? Who do you say?